The American War for Independence was my first historical love. When diving into the details of that war, it doesn't take long to discover all of the near misses and all the opportunities for alternate history. Washington's coat riddled with bullet holes, or Benedict Arnold's nearly successful plan to sink the entire war effort, the Battle of Trenton, New Jersey, the arrival of Baron von Steuben at Valley Forge, the fog that saved the army escaping from New York, the capture of General Charles Lee, the death of Dr. Warren, the French entering the war, all of these things had a bullet been one inch to the left or had the wind picked up a little bit or had any of the pivotal men or women not been in a certain place at a certain time, who knows how things would have played out. I have at least one ancestor who fought at Lexington and Concord. His name is John Bosworth. He would have been about 24 at the time, and he, like so many at the time, was a member of the Massachusetts militia, and he answered the alarm that the British were marching to seize their weapons. A little more than a decade ago, whilst doing research on this ancestor, I came across the writings of a British officer who not only was in the battle, but he wrote vivid accounts of what it was like. His letters do a wonderful thing. They give us a very human side of the enemy combatant in a battle that has taken on mythological proportions due to the poems and paintings depicting hard-nosed patriot farmers standing up for their rights against a tyrant king hell-bent on subduing them. And they're not wrong, it's just not the complete picture. And so, with this episode, to the extent that a non-historian and amateur podcaster can... I'm going to attempt to paint a more or less complete picture of the battle through the eyes of a British officer called Hugh Percy, kicking the hornet's nest. Reverend Edward Griffin Porter, pastor of Hancock Church in Lexington, Massachusetts, was preparing for the centennial celebration of the famous battle that launched the American War for Independence. It would no doubt be a star-spangled fest, complete with all sorts of late 19th century American pride. The rat-a-tat of marching drums, whistling fifes, black powder explosions, and fireworks that would illuminate the spring sky— commemorating that famed day when ordinary citizens stood toe-to-toe with the British Empire. But, for Edward Porter, he was in search of history. Patriotic pride was fine for a celebration, but he wanted the knit and grit of the battle. The mud and blood, if you will. He wanted to know what it was actually like on the ground for the soldiers. For Porter, the only way to get a complete picture of that consequential day was to seek out the enemy's perspective. He wanted to get his hands on British accounts of the battle. In this pursuit, Reverend Porter found himself in correspondence across the Atlantic with the 7th Duke of Northumberland. This Duke, Henry George Percy, was an indirect descendant of another Duke of Northumberland, who, a hundred years prior, was on the ground at the Battle of Lexington and Concord. In their correspondence, both Reverend Porter and the Duke of Northumberland became so fond of each other that the Duke invited the Reverend to visit him at his estate, Alnwick Castle in England. Reverend Porter jumped at the chance. After touring the castle's famous sprawling gardens and huge stone walls, Porter finally came upon a historian's holy grail, the library. As he scanned the collection of ancient books, he noticed, tucked away, In the corner of one of the bookshelves was a small tin box wrapped with a faded blue ribbon covered with a thick layer of dust. The caretaker of the Duke's library barely remembered the box, saying he thought it contained some obscure letters. Upon opening the box, Reverend Porter found a man, or rather, letters from a man, Hugh Percy, the second Duke of Northumberland. 
In this trove was the personal correspondence from the former Duke, primarily addressed to his father during his service as an officer in the British Army during the opening days of the rebellion in the colonies. Reverend Porter, trying to contain his excitement, respectfully asked if he might be allowed to copy the letters for posterity in America, and the Duke graciously granted his friend's request. Hugh Percy was born August 14, 1742, to Hugh and Elizabeth Smithson. You may notice that his parents have different last names than he does, and it's a bit confusing because of the way the English aristocracy works, but I'll do my damnedest to explain it. When his father, Hugh Smithson, married Elizabeth, who comes from the Seymour line, he married well. Once Elizabeth's father died, the inheritance of the ancient Percy barony, which also held lands in Northumberland, passed through her to her new husband, Hugh Smithson. To renew the old Percy name, he simply dropped Smithson and adopted Percy, and was eventually dubbed the first Duke of Northumberland by the king. Hugh and Elizabeth's first son was then named Hugh Percy, and the young Hugh's parents treated their new land holdings very well. They embarked on a campaign of reviving the beauty of their realm by rebuilding failing castles, fostering agricultural projects, improving the working conditions for their farmers, and even oversaw the planting of a thousand trees a year. In 1759, the young Hugh joined the British Army. He was only about 15, but he no doubt felt inspired to offer his services as his country had, for the past three years, been fighting against France and pretty much the rest of Europe in what would become known as the Seven Years' War. This war spilled into the American colonies as the French and Indian War. Fast forward two years later, and Percy reaches the rank of captain. He's commanding an entire regiment at the age of 17. This quick rise was due in no small part to his parents' significant positions in the English aristocracy. But lest we take away any credit due to him, Percy did see live action in the Seven Years' War, and he was noted to serve with distinction. He was likely recognized early on as a natural leader due to his calm, cool, and collected nature. After the war, Hugh Percy was a fast-rising star. He attended St. John's College in Cambridge, he courted and married a noblewoman named Anne Crichton Stewart, and he was elected to Parliament. While in Parliament, Percy was promoted to the rank of Colonel and appointed an aide-de-camp to King George III. After the Seven Years' War, the British Empire had a problem. It had racked up massive debt fighting the war, and on top of that, it had decided on a power move of leaving a standing army of 10,000 soldiers in America just in case the French got frisky again. To support this huge expense, they needed cash, and they needed it now. An obvious, perceivably easy revenue stream were its American colonies, and although previous attempts at taxing the colonists had not gone so well, they decided they would wrap it up in a different package and try it again. First, they would place a heavy tax burden on the legal professions and college students. The American colonists could better serve the empire's laborers, not professionals anyway. Second, they would tax just about every legal document generally needed by the public to carry out their everyday affairs. And third, they would require all paper goods be either products of London bearing the official stamp or be purchased with British currency as opposed to the colonial currency. In Parliament, while debating these various fundraising efforts, one English politician said, quote, And now these Americans, children planted by our care, nourished up by our indulgence, Until they are grown to a degree of strength and opulence, and protected by our arms, they will grudge to contribute their might to relieve us from the heavy weight of the burden which we now lie under, end quote. But a fiery member of Parliament, who also happened to be an Irish colonel, and one who spent a great deal of time in America, had a sharp and portentous response to these assertions, quote, They planted by your care? No. Your oppression planted them in America. They fled from your tyranny to a then uncultivated and unhospitable country where they exposed themselves to almost all the hardships to which human nature is liable, and among others, to the cruelties of a savage foe, the most subtle, and I take upon me to say the most formidable, of any people upon the face of God's earth. They nourished by your indulgence. They grew by your neglect of them. As soon as you began to care about them, that care was exercised in sending persons to rule over them in one department or another who were, perhaps, the deputies of deputies to some member of this house, sent to spy out their liberty, to misrepresent their action, and to prey upon them. 
men whose behavior on many occasions has caused the blood of those sons of liberty to recoil within them. They protected by your arms? They have nobly taken up arms in your defense and have exerted valor amidst their constant and laborious industry for the defense of a country whose frontier, while drenched in blood, its interior parts have yielded all its little savings to your emolument. The people, I believe, are as truly loyal as any subjects of the king has, but a people jealous of their liberties and who will vindicate them if they ever should be violated. But the subject is too delicate, and I will say no more. End quote. When a vote for the measures was cast, Hugh Percy thought them an unfair burden on the colonists and voted against them, but they passed nonetheless, and together they were dubbed the Stamp Act. As word reached America that the taxes associated with the Stamp Act were coming, 11 of the 13 colonies sent formal correspondence to Britain, arguing that neither Parliament nor the Crown had a legal right to levy said taxes, that they violate their rights as Englishmen, and that they effectively nullify the legal charters by which the colonies operate. And, as Sam Adams put it, they essentially reduced the colonists from free subjects to tributary slaves. And so, with such universal contempt for these policies, the Stamp Act was dead on arrival in the New World. And the slogan, No Taxation Without Representation, was born. And simultaneously, Sam Adams and his Sons of Liberty began organizing protest rallies, burning effigies of tax collectors, and of King George himself. Soon... The officials charged with collecting the revenues for the Stamp Act resigned due to immense public pressure and forcible persuasion. In the end, the act was never really implemented. For the colonists, without actual representation in government, taxes were not going to happen. It didn't matter what for or how small. There was little the Crown could use as leverage, too, against them. The Americans were a huge consumer population, and they had learned to acquire the goods they wanted at the lowest possible cost, which was never from London. In Boston, on March 5th, 1770, a mob gathered outside a few British soldiers at their post. By the end of the confrontation, unarmed civilians lay dead at the hands of the most powerful army in the world. The mob was not innocent in this affair, and the Sons of Liberty probably had something to do with it, but it doesn't matter. Optics are everything. Paul Revere etched the image of the massacre into an engraving that made its rounds in the local papers, and, thanks to the most efficient postal system in the world, designed personally by Benjamin Franklin, every single person in the 13 colonies knew of the Boston Massacre weeks before Parliament or the King found out. Three years later... Parliament would again try taxing the petulant colonists. This time, their tea was in the crosshairs. But the Sons of Liberty responded with perhaps the most famous protest event in all of history by dressing up as Native Americans and dumping 342 chests of tea from the nearly bankrupt East India Company into Boston Harbor, destroying it all, and it's nearly $2 million by today's worth. This was the last straw for the Crown. The colonists, and particularly Boston, must suffer for their continued insolence. Boston Harbor was ordered closed, and a blockade was enforced by the Royal Navy, effectively shutting down the Boston economy and putting thousands out of work. But that wasn't all. An army of occupation was being mustered to sail across the ocean, to frighten the colonies into submission, and to make an example of Boston. And in the spring of 1774, at the age of 31, the son of the Duke of Northumberland, Colonel Hugh Percy, was to be among them. As Percy waited in Ireland for his ship, the Symmetry, to carry him to America, he penned a few letters back home to relatives. Quote, I find we are to have eight regiments there. I fancy severity is intended. Surely the people of Boston are not mad enough to think of opposing us. Headiness and temper will, I hope, set things in that quarter to rights and General Gage is the proper man to do it, end quote. Hugh Percy comes across as a refreshingly nuanced man. He opposed the tax burden placed on the colonists, yet at the same time, he felt an obligation to enforce the authority of the British crown. He also here seems to think quite highly of General Gage, the commander of the crown's forces in Boston. However, these relatively rosy outlooks would change nearly as soon as he landed in the New World. Quote, My dearest father, as I am certain you will be anxious to hear from me, I take the earliest opportunity after my arrival of acquainting you that I am here and in good health. You will perceive by the date of this, for we had only come about an hour ago, that we have had a very bad passage. 
I have the misfortune, for I must think it so, of commanding the camp here. The people, by all accounts, are extremely violent and wrong-headed, so much so that I fear we shall be obliged to come to extremities. I am in a complete scene of confusion, as we are to land and encamp directly. Adieu, my dearest father, and be assured, I ever remain your dutiful son, Percy. And I beg my best duty to my mother, to whom I shall write in a day or two. End quote. Percy's commander, General Gage, had metaphorical fires to put out all over the colony of Massachusetts that required his personal attention. And so as soon as Percy arrived, Gage promoted him to Brigadier General and put him in charge of the camp in his absence. Besides this duty, Percy personally commanded the Crown's 5th Regiment, outfitted with all sorts of artillery. As Hugh Percy interacted more with the Bostonians, he began to realize just how deep-seated the hatred was for the mother country. Quote, the people here talk much and do little, but nothing, I am sure, will ever reestablish peace and quiet in this country except steadiness and perseverance on the part of the administration. The people in this part of the country are in general made up of rashness and timidity. Quick and violent in their determinations, they are fearful in the execution of them, unless indeed they are quite certain of meeting little or no opposition, and then, like all other cowards, they are cruel and tyrannical. To hear them talk, you would imagine that they would attack us and demolish us every night. Yet, whenever we appear, they are frightened out of their wits. One thing I will be bold to say, which is that till you make their committees of correspondence and Congress with the other colonies high treason and try them for it in England, you must never expect perfect obedience and submission from this to the mother country. I am sorry to say that no body of men in this province are so extremely injurious to the peace and tranquility of it as the clergy. They preach up sedition openly from the pulpits. End quote. The pulpits in America were long identified as a problem for the British. But what about the committees of correspondence? What are those? The name sounds innocuous enough, but they are essentially shadow governments of the colonies. As time went on, these committees, these small bodies of patriots peppered through the colonies, became ever more unified in purpose. And eventually, Many citizens began to see the committees as the true representatives of the colonies, since they were at least nominated locally, not by some king 3,000 miles away. As Percy wrote back home, mostly to his father, the Duke of Northumberland, the demeanor of the Americans was wearing on him. But at the same time, he was ever more impressed by the beauty of the American countryside. In August of 1774, he wrote the following notes home, quote, I assure you it requires a far abler pen than mine to describe its different beauties. It is, as far at least as I have been around this town, most delightfully varied. The hills rising from the valleys by gradual and gentle ascents, interspersed everywhere with trees, give it a most agreeable appearance. Nor do the small lakes of water with which the country abounds contribute little towards the richness of the scene. In short, it has everywhere the appearance of a park finely laid out. It is the most beautiful country I ever saw in my life, and if the people were only like it, we should do very well. Everything, however, is as yet quiet, but they threaten much. Not that I believe they will dare act. The people here are a set of sly, artful, hypocritical rascals, cruel, and cowards. I must own that I cannot but despise them completely. God knows when I shall return, for I do not see the least prospect of any alteration in matters here as yet, and whilst things continue in their present situation, I cannot stir. End quote. Despite Hugh's noble birth and rank, he was obliged to camp with his soldiers. But, desiring a place to at least entertain his aristocratic peers who may pass through, he rented a small house not far from the camp. There, he kept the dining room table set and ready to go for his guests. One night he even had the honor of hosting Major John Andre, who, one could argue, was the most consequential British soldier of the entire war. But that is a tale for another day. In late August, Percy's letters grow more anxious, and he begins to show a dissatisfaction with the way the occupation is being handled, and he feels things may be reaching a boiling point if better leadership is not soon established. And yet, he says, quote, Be that as it may... I am resolved cheerfully to do my duty as long as ever I continue in the service. End quote. The closing of Boston Harbor, known as the Port Bill, earlier in the year, was not the end of the Crown's punitive measures against the city, but just the beginning of a series of acts put out by Parliament. The Massachusetts Government Act, 
In one fell swoop, the English government revoked the city's charter and government, bringing it under the direct oversight of the king. Nearly every local government position was replaced by loyalists, directly appointed by the new puppet governor. Town meetings were made illegal unless the governor deigned to call one himself. In the Administration of Justice Act, referred to as the Murder Act by George Washington, this allowed any royal officer charged with a crime against a colonist to be shipped off back to London, where justice would then be decided. Washington, like other colonists, were convinced that this act provided legal cover for any atrocity that a British officer may commit on a whim. In the Quartering Act, this was the requirement for the citizens to house the king's soldiers. Usually this only meant common buildings such as meeting halls. There's still debate today as to whether this act would have actually allowed soldiers to be shacked up in residences, but the act itself did not explicitly say one way or the other, so who knows? It certainly would have been possible, and it was feared by everyone. Perhaps what was most offensive about this act was that it was the only one that applied to all 13 colonies, unifying them all in the fate of Boston. On the ground level for the people of Boston, the most immediate effects of these acts were seen when the publicly elected judges and sheriffs and councilmen were removed from office and replaced with loyalists. These replacements probably didn't want these jobs very much. They were nominated to these positions by a government and a king that their neighbors despised with every fiber in their body. And the only thing that guaranteed their ability to hold their office was the sharp points of several thousand bayonets in the hands of the infamous Redcoats. These new counselors likely lived in fear for their very lives every day. Of them, Percy says, quote, Such a set of timid creatures I never did see. Those of the new council that live any distance from the town have remained here ever since they took their oaths, and are, I am told, afraid to go home. As for the opposite party, they are arming and exercising all over the country. Yet I am still convinced that nothing but either drunkenness or madness will force them to molest us. If, however, they once begin, I fear there will be some bloodshed. End quote. Arming and exercising. That is the last thing that any army of occupation wants to see of the population. On top of this, the Americans began finding hilarious loopholes in the acts that the British levied against them. Percy writes of one technicality that particularly annoyed him. Quote, Their method of eluding that part of the act, which relates to the town meetings, is strongly characteristic of the people. They say that since the town meetings are forbid by the act, that they shall not hold them. But as they do not see any mention of county meetings, they shall hold them. They therefore go a mile out of town, do just the same business there they formerly did in Boston, call it a county meeting, and so elude the act. End quote. It was becoming clear to Percy that without force, law and order would not be possible. Quote, In short, I am certain that it will require a great length of time, much steadiness, and many troops to reestablish good order in government. I plainly foresee that there is not a new council or magistrate who will dare to act without at least a regiment at his heels, and it is not quite clear to me that he will even act then as he ought to do. End quote. Remember those committees of correspondence we talked about a little bit earlier, and how Percy pointed out that they should be the primary target of the British? Well, now with all 13 colonies under threat from the burdens placed on Boston, They've all fused together in a more formal and unified body dubbed the Continental Congress. And Percy observes that four prominent men from Boston are ceremoniously leaving the city to join this Congress in Philadelphia. Thomas Cushing, Robert Treat Payne, Samuel Adams, leader of the Sons of Liberty, and his cousin, John Adams. And the arms building is ever increasing. Quote, My dearest father, Things here are now drawing to a crisis every day. The people here openly oppose the new acts. They have taken up arms in almost every part of this province and have driven in the government and most of the council. The few that remain in the country, they have not only obliged to resign, but to take up arms with them. A few days ago, they mustered about 7,000 men at Worcester, to which place they have conveyed about 20 pieces of cannon. In short, this country is now in as an open state of rebellion as Scotland was in the year 45. The general's great lenity and moderation serve only to make them more daring and insolent. It is astonishing with what discretion and prudence he behaves himself, 
He has given them every proof that his utmost wish is to restore peace and tranquility without coming to violent measures. But this behavior they term timidity and fancy that the troops are unable to act against them, an error which sometime or other they will find out to their cost. End quote. Percy soon identifies a peculiarity to the laws and traditions of the colony of Massachusetts that the British haven't come to terms with yet. It's that in this colony, every citizen was legally required to own muskets and weapons for war, and their militia were taken very seriously. A holdover of a way of life from the early days of the colony when raids by Indians were a continuous existential threat. Quote, what makes an insurrection here always more formidable than in other places is that there is a law of this province which obliges every inhabitant to be furnished with a firelock, bayonet, and pretty considerable quantity of ammunition, besides which every township is obliged by the same law to have a large magazine of all kinds of military stores. They are moreover trained four times in each year so that they do not make despicable appearances as soldiers, though they were never yet known to behave themselves even decently in the field. Besides which, as they will neither suffer any court to sit or magistrate to act, there is total suspension of all law and justice. End quote. Despite the obvious buildup of arms in anticipation of a conflict, Percy still does not recognize the militias as a significant threat. And he could be forgiven for that when you consider the unrivaled professionalism and might of the British Empire demonstrated throughout the world. By October... Hugh Percy has been stationed in Boston for over six months, and he sees only two outcomes for the occupation. Quote, Our affairs here are in the most critical situation imaginable. Nothing less than total loss or conquest of the colonies must be the end of it. Either indeed is disagreeable, but one or the other is now absolutely necessary. End quote. As winter sets in in 1774, General Gage begins discussing the coming necessity to march into the countryside outside of Boston to begin enforcing the acts passed by Parliament. But Percy believes this may be too little too late. Quote, The Provincial Congress I find met again yesterday, and I am informed that they mean to proceed to the choice of a new government. They have already raised an army, seized the public money, and have taken themselves all the powers of government. I really begin now to think that it will come to blows at last for they are most amazingly encouraged by our having done nothing yet. In short, they have got to such lengths that nothing can secure the colonies to the mother country but the conquest of them. The people here are the most designing, artful villains in the world. End quote. On December 13th, an event happens. Patriot leaders in Massachusetts get word that the British may seek to remove a colonial munitions depot at Fort William and Mary in New Hampshire. Paul Revere rides forth with the news. The problem is that the munitions depot was under British guard, but it's only six men. Patriots flood the fort and overwhelm the guard and remove some hundred barrels of gunpowder, musket supplies, and 16 cannons. They also tore down the British flag. And Percy recounts the news of this event. Quote, with this prize, they marched afterwards to Exeter, a town about 16 miles distant from Portsmouth, where they have secured them under a strong guard. By this, you will see how universal this spirit is, and to what length it has got, and therefore how necessary to crush it before it is too late. End quote. As I've mentioned, Hugh Percy and his father were generally not in favor of the punitive actions the Crown and Parliament were taking against the colonists. But Hugh felt he had a duty to his country. His father, however, fearing his son would be caught up in an unending war of attrition on the other side of the world, he used his influence as the Duke of Northumberland to gain permission from the king for Hugh to be sent back to England. And in the early spring of 1775, when news of this unexpected fortune reached Hugh Percy, he respectfully declined the offer. At about this same time, the Provincial Congress of Massachusetts at Concord published a resolution. Quote, Whenever the army under the command of General Gage or any part thereof to the number of 500 shall march out of the town of Boston with artillery and baggage, it ought to be deemed a design to carry into execution by force the late acts of Parliament, the attempting of which, by the resolve of the late Honorable Continental Congress, ought to be opposed. And therefore, 
the military force of the province ought to be assembled, and an army of observation immediately formed, to act solely on the defensive, so long as it can be justified on the principles of reason and self-preservation. End quote. Massachusetts had drawn a line in the sand. A British force of greater than 500 on the march would be opposed. A few weeks later, General Gage received top-secret orders from London. Take decisive action against the colonists now. For Gage, these orders were probably not ones that he wanted. He had tried for so long not to come to blows with the Americans. and The orders were vague enough to leave the target up to him, but there was only one possible target. Concord. Everyone knew that is where the militia stockpiles were. As the sun was setting on April 18th, Hugh Percy is summoned to Gage's quarters, along with a small number of the top commanding staff. Gage solemnly tells them of the orders that he had received, which he had kept utterly secret for the past five days. Lieutenant Colonel Smith and Major Pitcairn would lead 700 soldiers to seize the weapons at Concord. Brigadier General Percy would be on standby with a relief force to cover their retreat if Gage felt it was needed. Gage reiterated the utmost secrecy to this mission and advised the commanders not to tell their soldiers the aim of the march until they were already underway. At 9 p.m., Smith and Pitcairn began readying their troops, while Percy casually walked out into the Boston Commons. As he made small talk with the citizens, one of them prodded Percy about the troop movement, and Percy played dumb. But the man went on, telling him that the Redcoats will miss their aim. What aim? asked Percy. The cannon at Concord, replied the man. Stunned at the apparent common knowledge of the top-secret mission, Percy darted back for General Gage's quarters and informed him that the folk out in the street of Boston were well aware of what was happening. Gage knew well of the night Riders employed by the committees of correspondence and moved to shut down all routes out of Boston before they could go out and tell everybody. But it was too late. William Dawes and Paul Revere had already left on horseback, making history. Colonial intelligence was far deeper than Gage, Percy, or any other British officer could have ever imagined. It may have even extended to Gage's own bedchamber. The colonists had a well-placed informant across the Atlantic, and so when the orders were issued out of London to take action against the colonists in Massachusetts, they found out before Gage did. But those orders, as we've said, were relatively vague. How did they know Gage would act on the morning of April 19th? Margaret Gage, Thomas Gage's wife, was born in New Jersey and was, furthermore, not so quiet about her sympathies with the Patriot cause. She also was good friends with Dr. Joseph Warren of the Sons of Liberty and de facto military leader of the movement. Dr. Warren was known to have a high-placed informant in the British command that could only be called upon for the utmost need. Nothing, of course, can be proven as Dr. Warren took the secret to his grave at the Battle of Bunker Hill, but the circumstantial evidence is staggering. The plan for the British Column's march would begin by crossing the Charles River and landing in Cambridge, where they would continue their land march to Concord, roughly 20 miles. Their loading onto river barges was confused and disorganized, and they didn't actually unload on the other side of the river until midnight. When they did unload, it was into waist-deep water. Meanwhile, Paul Revere and company had set off a chain reaction of alarm systems across the Massachusetts countryside that had an exponential effect. One rider would tell two more, two more would tell four more, and so on. A bell would be rung that would signal the neighbor a mile down the road to light a bonfire, that would signal another to play drums or sound a trumpet, that would lead another to set off a round of musket shots, rousing the next town, to wake up the Minutemen, to muster the militia. The British were coming. By the time Smith and Pitcairn had crossed the half-mile-wide river and gotten everyone ashore, every patriot in a 25-mile radius was aware of their mission. By 3 a.m., the column reached the town of Menetomy, where they could hear the bells and the trumpets of the colonial alarm system, confirming that they had lost the element of surprise. Colonel Smith ordered Pitcairn to hurry ahead with an advance guard of probably around 400 men to Concord, while he would follow behind with the remaining body. He also sent messengers back to General Gage for reinforcements. On their way to Concord, Pitcairn's advance guard needed to pass through Lexington, which they reached as the sun was rising. As they entered the town, 77 militia emerged from a tavern and marched out into the town commons to observe the British movements. 
Captain John Parker was leading them. He was a veteran of the French and Indian War, and he was racked with tuberculosis, and he could barely raise his voice above a whisper. And a quarter of the men at his side were his relatives. As he arranged his men, he was remembered to have said, quote, Stand your ground. Do not fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have war, let it begin here. End quote. That line could be apocryphal, but it's a great line regardless. Instead of marching past the militia and on to Concord, parts of Pitcairn's force attempted to surround and flank the militia. There are conflicting accounts about how all of this went down, but it's generally thought that Pitcairn waved his sword in the air, shouting, quote, Lay down your arms, you damned rebels, end quote. Captain Parker, knowing full well that his militia was no match for this confrontation, ordered his militia to disperse. But amidst the shouting and chaos of this unbelievably tense situation, and on top of that, his voice was nearly inaudible anyway, only a few of his men heard him, and some began to walk away, some stayed put. But someone, no one knows who, someone, somewhere, on that town commons in Lexington, Massachusetts, fired a shot. Each side, thinking that the other had fired the first shot, Open fire across the commons, and the terrified and confused militiamen largely missed, but the British found their marks as some of the militiamen began dropping to the ground. Pitcairn lost control of his men as they burst forward with a bayonet charge. Captain Parker's own cousin was impaled, and after the bayonet charge, the militia fled the field and the British soldiers turned to fire into the homes, preparing for a house-to-house -house sweep. But just in the nick of time, Colonel Smith arrived with the remainder of the British force, and seeing the chaos befalling his men, he rode forward and found a drummer and ordered the troops back to their ranks. As the British regrouped and continued on to Concord, seven colonial militiamen lay dead in the field. One man, Jonathan Harrington, bleeding from a musket ball lodged somewhere in his body, crawled through the town all the way to his house and died on his doorstep. News of the skirmish at Lexington quickly made its way to the 400 or so militia at Concord. Anticipating the British at any moment, they amassed just north of the town on a hill to, again, observe the enemy's actions. As the British marched into the town square, Colonel Smith sent his troops to various locations that, based on intelligence, should have housed rebel weapons caches. One regiment went north, over a bridge, and headed for a farm rumored to have weapons. With it being two miles outside the city, they left behind about a hundred men to guard the bridge that they crossed. So far, Colonel Smith had only found a couple cannon pieces that would have been of little use to the militia, but he nonetheless ordered the weapons burned in the town square. Upon seeing the smoke, the militia amassing north of the town decided they had to act. They approached the aforementioned North Bridge under British guard. The British opened fire on the advancing militia, but were quickly overwhelmed. Once the militia returned fire, the bridge guards scattered, leaving the detachment searching out the farm to the north without a return route. Colonel Smith, hearing the gunfire coming from the north bridge, personally marched to see what was happening. And he was met with the bridge guard fleeing for their lives while the militia took up positions behind walls and buildings. Smith could not afford to abandon this bridge because he knew that the soldiers searching out the farms in the north would need a return route. And so an intense standoff began. And then, like something out of a spaghetti western movie, as both sides were staring down each other's muskets, an alleged mentally handicapped man named Elias Brown began wandering between the two armies, attempting to sell them hard cider, if only to witness this scene. At about 11.30, the detachment searching the farm returned to find the dead bodies of their comrades scattered over the bridge, with the militia held up in strong defensive positions, continuing to observe the British actions. The detachment reported to Colonel Smith the dismal news that nothing had been found at the farms. And this continued failure to find anything of any military value was frustrating the tired and hungry soldiers. On top of this, rumor was spreading through their ranks that the militia were scalping dead redcoats as they marched. No one knows if this is true or not, and again, it really doesn't matter. What matters is the British perceived it to be true adding anger and desires of vengeance to the fruitless mission. Smith and Pitcairn, unsure of how to proceed, they ordered their men to pause for lunch while they debated what the next moves would be. While the British ate lunch, more colonial militiamen were pouring into Concord from every corner of the colony. Smith and Pitcairn, I don't think, had perceived the size of the hornet's nest they had just kicked. 
What had at first been an irregular force of a few hundred was now a few thousand. Anticipating the Redcoats would eventually have to march back to their camp in Boston, many of the militia went ahead down the road and waited. Finally, Smith and Pitcairn determined that they had exhausted all of their intelligence on the whereabouts of the rebel weapons cache, and that the intelligence was either false or the rebels had simply moved everything. And so, they ordered their soldiers to ready themselves for the 20-mile march back to Boston. Keep in mind, by this time, these soldiers had been awake for nearly 30 hours and started the day with sopping wet clothes. As the march commenced, Colonel Smith noted the growing militia force shadowing their movements and from a safe distance off the road. Then a musket shot here, another there, and soon the balls could be heard whizzing past the troops. Fearing being outflanked, he attempted to arrange a detachment alongside the road to protect the flanks of his own men. But coming to a bridge crossing outside of Concord, they had to fall back in with the main body, and the 700 men were then forced to cross the bridge at only three abreast. The militia saw their chance and rushed in to move against the rear guard of the British column. Smith, anticipating the attack, ordered the rear guard to wheel around and fire a musket volley into the advancing militia lines. But, perhaps due to extreme exhaustion, they fired wild, missing every shot. The militia paused to return fire, dropping ten redcoats to the ground instantly. Smith rushed his men across the bridge as fast as possible and resumed the flanking protection, all the while taking militia fire from the rear. Down the road a bit more were 500 militiamen waiting on top a hill for the redcoats' approach. Smith ordered a bayonet charge, hoping to scare them off, but the militia held their ground. The charge by Smith failed and brought him more casualties. And so instead of fighting it out, he hurried his men once more away from the militia. But these 500 militia soldiers, they joined ranks with the thousands from Concord and flanked the British from the forest, firing random shots into their lines, harassing them, shouting at them, utterly terrifying them. Every once in a while, a stray ball would strike a soldier, dropping him to the ground. The British column then came to a particularly dangerous point in their road. It rose swiftly up a hill, turned hard to the left, and then climbed again to the right, all surrounded by forest. The militia that were pouring in from the east and those that had already been tailing the column from the west converged on this point and set up a deadly crossfire. Once the British entered this death trap, hell erupted from the woods from all sides. Flash, flash, flash from the shade of trees was all the Redcoats could see of the militia. Colonel Smith had no options other than running his men through this gauntlet as fast as possible, leaving behind 30 men dead in the road. Now, with open fields on either side of the road, Smith again sent out his flankers, but the militia were simply picking them off one by one. And now, even firing back became a serious problem. They were running out of ammunition. Making it now back to Lexington, where the first shot of the war was fired just hours earlier, another group of militia launched a surprise attack from behind a hill and fired down into the British column. These men, Smith and Pitcairn, had seen before. They were the original militiamen from Lexington, led by Captain John Parker. Some of them were bandaged up and back in the fight after their previous encounter. Colonel Smith was hit in the thigh by a musket ball, and his horse threw him to the ground. So Major Pitcairn assumed command of the broken force. He launched a frontal assault against Captain John Parker up the hill, but Parker's men rained down lead upon them, and in the chaos, Pitcairn's horse bucked and kicked in fright, and throwing him to the ground and injuring his arm. Now both British commanders were wounded in action. At this, some of the British soldiers surrendered or simply gave up and collapsed from exhaustion. Others broke into a full panic-stricken dash, running the hell back to Boston. One officer among them recounts, quote, We attempted to stop the men and form them in too deep, but to no purpose. The confusion increased rather than lessened. The officers got to the front and presented their bayonets and told the men if they advanced, they should die. Upon this, they began to form up under heavy fire, end quote. Those that fell back in line were still being shadowed and fired upon from all sides of the road. They were bloodied, beaten, sore, tired, hungry, dirty, shell-shocked, out of ammunition, and leaderless. And Boston was simply too far away. In mere moments, it appeared, 700 British soldiers were about to either surrender or die. But suddenly... 
From the front of the column, they could hear shouting and cheering, and again a full-on sprint began, but those in the rear didn't know what for. They probably didn't care. They just ran. As a clearing emerged in the road, the sight of their salvation lay before them. Brigadier General Hugh Percy had come to meet them with a thousand fresh soldiers from Boston and two six-pound cannons. The nearly dead British soldiers dashed behind Percy's lines and collapsed to the ground. Out from the woods emerged the thousands of militia on their heels, but Percy was ready for them, and he ordered his cannons to unload on the rebels, scattering them back into the woods. Percy had left Boston around 9 a.m. and had spent all morning looking for Smith and Pitcairn. Gage's original plan called for Percy to reinforce the march back to Boston much earlier. He was originally supposed to leave at 4 a.m., but because of Gage's obsession with secrecy, the orders were unclear and miscommunicated in a series of deadly errors. Percy recounts his futile search on the morning of April 19th, quote, As all the houses were shut up and there was not the appearance of a single inhabitant, I could get no intelligence concerning them till I had passed Menetomy when I was informed that the rebels had attacked His Majesty's troops, who were retiring, overpowered by numbers, greatly exhausted and fatigued, and having expended almost all their ammunition. And about two o'clock, I met them retiring through the town of Lexington. Percy first heard the gunfire through the woods, and then the shouting, and then more gunfire, but closer and closer, and he ordered his men to take up defensive formations and ready the cannon and it was mere moments later when the column stumbled forward out of the woods. Quote, I immediately ordered the two field pieces to fire at the rebels, and drew up the brigade on a height. The shot from the cannon had the desired effect and stopped the rebels for a little time, who immediately dispersed and endeavored to surround us, being very numerous. End quote. Percy took command of the column and allowed for a brief respite for the men to rest, tend to the wounded, and eat and rehydrate. At 3.30, they set out for a final march to Boston. Quote, As it began now to grow pretty late, and we had 15 miles to retire, and only 36 rounds, I ordered the grenadiers and light infantry to move off first, and covered them with my brigade, sending out very strong flanking parties, which were absolutely necessary, as there was not a stone wall or house, though before in appearance evacuated, from whence the rebels did not fire upon us. End quote. 36 rounds per soldier between Lexington and Boston was all they had. Earlier, when Percy had left Boston to relieve the British column, Gage anticipated they would need more ammunition, and he organized two wagons to be loaded up and hauled to Percy, along with it, one officer and 13 soldiers. But they were stopped by a small group of older, semi-retired militiamen who took lighter jobs like guarding roads. The old man ordered the Redcoats to surrender their wagon and themselves, or they would open fire. But the lead officer ignored them and attempted to drive past. And so, the retired militiamen fired a volley, killing the horses, two soldiers, and wounding the lead officer. The survivors surrendered immediately. With the rebels on their tail again, Percy created a rotating rearguard so that each guard only spent a few minutes under heavy fire and then would be refreshed by rested troops. He also put reinforced flanking companies on both sides of the road and sent his crack troops to the front to sweep it clear of rebels. It was an effective formation, but the Americans were adapting as well. Some were now racing ahead on horseback, dismounting to hide in the woods and then firing musket volleys at Percy's men. And then once the column passed, they'd ride again and repeat over and over again, each time outpacing the flanking troops. The citizenry, too, was getting in on the fight. They were sending supply wagons of food and water and munitions to keep the militia energized and refreshed. By now, all of the Massachusetts militia had reached the area surrounding Boston, unified around a common enemy who was just so easy to pick out because of their bright red colors. As Percy's column entered Menetomy, yet another fresh group of militia awaited them. And every corner, every alley erupted in musket fire as Percy passed through. Even the wives of the militiamen rained shot down from the windows of their homes. The entire city of Menetomy was collapsing upon the column that Percy's trying to save from utter destruction. Quote, Whoever looks upon them as an irregular mob will find himself much mistaken. They have men amongst them who know very well what they are about 
having been employed as rangers against the Indians and Canadians, and this country being much covered with wood and hilly, is very advantageous to their method of fighting. Nor are several of their men devoid of a spirit of enthusiasm, for many of them concealed themselves in houses and advanced within ten yards to fire at me and other officers, though they were morally certain of being put to death themselves in an instant. End quote. As the chaos of Menetomy persisted, Percy's control of the men started to unravel. Enraged and tired of being fired on from windows and rooftops, they entered the homes and the businesses to engage in house-to-house -house combat. Here is where we get accounts of cold-blooded murder alleged against the British soldiers, who, by this point, were probably driven mad by no sleep and ceaseless gunfire. It's estimated that the militia by this point was a unified force of around 4,000 men. The militia, with their huge numbers, advanced down the road again ahead of Percy to set up one last trap that would finally destroy the column. But at the last minute, Percy veered off the main road and took a lesser-used route back to Charleston. This move finally broke his men free from the militia encirclement that had stalked them ever since Concord. As they chased Percy back into the British strongholds in Boston, Gage sent fresh troops to cover their retreat, and now Navy cannons from the coast were in range to protect the column. And it was here, on the outskirts of Boston, where the militia finally gave up their pursuit of the Redcoats. Many of the British soldiers stumbling back into camp had now been without sleep for two full days. They had marched 40 miles in 21 hours, and for much of that time they were under constant fire from all sides. They had come for the colonists' guns. They had come to disarm the citizenry and force them into capitulation. But for all their sacrifice, for all their toil and hardship and blood, they had nothing to show for it. The British had gotten nothing. And Gage had done the one thing that he desperately wanted to avoid. He had started a war. Percy all but says this directly in his report of the battle. Quote, you may depend on it, that as the rebels now have had time to prepare, they are determined to go through with it. Nor will the insurrection here turn out so despicable as perhaps it is imagined at home. For my part, I never believed, I confess, that they would have attacked the king's troops, or have had the perseverance I found in them yesterday. End quote. The Massachusetts militia that chased the Redcoats back to Boston didn't just disperse. They dug in for a siege, and they began to build earthworks and reinforce their position around Gage, trapping him in a stranglehold so that the sea was his only mode of escape. When news of the humiliating defeat reached England, Gage is removed from command and sent back across the Atlantic. Before his return, though, he took time to write well of Hugh Percy's leadership during the whole affair. Quote, Lord Percy has acquired great honor. He was in every place of danger, cool, deliberate, and wise in his orders. He commanded and behaved with distinguished honor, and though he was continually in a shower of bullets, and an object that was much aimed at on horseback, came off unhurt. End quote. Gage also had some words of warning to Parliament about the sort of war that they were about to dive headlong into. Quote, these people show a spirit and a conduct against us that they never showed against the French. They are now spirited up by a rage and enthusiasm as great as a people ever were possessed of, and you must proceed in earnest or give the business up. A small body acting in one spot will not avail. You must have large armies making diversions on different sides to divide their forces. The loss we have sustained is greater than we can bear. Small armies cannot afford such losses, especially when the advantage gained tends to do little more than the gaining of a post. End quote. In the following days, more militia from the other colonies began arriving, from Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Connecticut. And two months later, the Second Continental Congress, representing all 13 colonies, adopts the Massachusetts militia as the Continental Army and puts George Washington in charge of it. After almost a year of sieging the city, a young soldier and former bookseller in Boston shows up and presents Washington with artillery cannons that were captured from Fort Ticonderoga. The next day, the British wake up on a cool March morning in Boston to find rebel cannons bearing down on their position. Recognizing the untenable situation, the British finally abandoned Boston back to the Bostonians. And four months later, the colonies formally declare their independence from Great Britain and its king. For Percy, 
After the Battle of Lexington and Concord, his military career didn't go too well. He, like many other officers, could not get along with Gage's replacement, General Howe. This dissolving relationship kept him out of the key battles fought over the next year. Though he did see combat again, he was outmaneuvered by Washington at the Battle of Trenton. And though Percy's men defended his leadership, General Howe and Percy had had enough of each other. After 28 days at sea, Percy arrived home again on June 2, 1777. Upon his arrival, he was received by King George III, spending two hours with the sovereign. Percy was well-liked by much of the aristocracy, and he was seen as a cool head who could be relied upon for sober thinking. And so the many, many English politicians and leaders who opposed the war to begin with used his return to show the war effort's continued mismanagement. In less than three months after his return, he was named a lieutenant general in the army, and though now a peer of General Howe, he never spoke ill of him publicly. In 1779, Percy, citing adultery, divorced his wife, but he quickly remarried to Francis Julia Burrell, and with her, he had six daughters and three sons. In 1786, his father, the Duke of Northumberland, died, leaving the entire state and title to Hugh Percy, who became the second Duke of Northumberland. On July 10th, 1817, Hugh Percy passed from this world, bequeathing his inheritance to his sons. Following his death, someone, we don't know who, gathered up all of the Duke's letters from the war, carefully placing them in a small tin box and lovingly wrapping them in a blue ribbon, setting it aside on an obscure bookshelf where it waited to be discovered years later by an American pastor of a small church all the way from Lexington, Massachusetts. Because we only have Hugh's side of the correspondence, there's almost nothing of the replies from the various people he wrote to during his time in America. But we do have one, and it's from his proud mother, and it's just a single sentence. Quote, I admire you for marching with your regiment. I dare say you are the only man of your rank who ever performed such a journey on foot. side note fun fact about Hugh Percy his illegitimate half-brother James Smithson who died with no heirs wrote in his will quote I then bequeath the whole of my property to the United States of America to found at Washington under the name of the Smithsonian Institution an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men end quote the odd thing is he never once visited America while he was alive but I thought that was an awesome little fact that needed to be tossed in somewhere, so hope you found that interesting. If you enjoyed this episode and you felt like it was worth a dollar, I'd gladly take that dollar to help offset the various production, and research, and hosting costs associated with running this little history podcast. You can become a patron for a dollar a month at patreon.com slash writteninbloodhistory, or you can follow the link on my website at writteninbloodhistory.com. As a patron, you get all sorts of behind-the-scenes stuff and access to whatever it is I'm working on at the moment, as well as early releases of episodes, and I'll even give you a little shout-out on the next episode that I record. Another huge way you can help me here is by leaving a rating or review on wherever you listen. Those ratings not only make me feel good about myself, but they have major implications in organic leadership. As always, my sister Courtney does a killer job with the cover art for the show. And if you're in need of freelance services, you can reach her at cjdejulius.myportfolio.com. And I would also recommend checking out her uh, history t-shirt designs on my swag shop. If you make a purchase, $5 supports the show and $5 goes to her. So it's a great way to support both this podcast and an independent artist. If you want to get a hold of me, you can email me at Stephen with a ph, stephen.dejulius at gmail.com. Or my Twitter handle is at SDJulius. Or go to the Written in Blood Facebook page and you can send me a message there. And so, with all that out of the way, thank you for listening to Written in Blood History. 
and have a happy 4th of July. See you later.